Open the pod bay doors now. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. In her 2014 book, The Sixth Extinction, An Unnatural History, Elizabeth Colbert states, if extinction is a morbid topic, mass extinction is, well, massively so. It's also a fascinating one. In her book, she attempts to convey both sides, the excitement of what's being learned as well as the horror of it. Therefore, discourse surrounding mass extinction necessarily involves this dynamic between fascination and horror. It may seem morbid to find extinction somewhat fascinating, but consider the ways scientists attempt to acknowledge the generative role mass extinction can play. As the Global Vanishing Acts exhibit at the Smithsonian's Natural History Museum states, extinctions create new opportunities for surviving species to spread, diversify, and prosper. So why not, at the behest of Elizabeth Colbert, appreciate both sides of mass extinction? One consequence of appreciating the wonder and fascination of learning about mass extinction is that we must recognize how drastically different the sixth mass extinction is from the previous five. We must recognize how we as humans are the cause. Honing in on the term Anthropocene, recent extinction explains that these rapid rates of animal species extinction are caused by humans overexploiting the earth through land development, deforestation, extraction of natural resources, as well as poaching, overfishing, and polluting the oceans, rivers, and air. At the risk of appearing like a doomsday prophet, Director Luis Sahoyos has elected to illustrate the negative consequences of the sixth mass extinction. That is, to convey the immediate peril many species currently face. As Sahoyos explains, the wildlife trade is second only to the drug market. It's that lucrative. Although graphic images taken covertly, oh, sorry, through graphic images taken covertly, racing extinction documents the devastation of the animal trade in an attempt to generate advocacy efforts. However, this film is not without fascination. Racing extinction conveys wonder, excitement, and beauty um, through compelling imagery of nature that will make the audience, all of you, question, why would we destroy this? This film follows the same vein of many contemporary environmental documentaries, which puts it in conversation with films such as Chasing Ice, which was a popular draw here at the IU Cinema in 2013. Having both worked as photographers for National Geographic, Chasing Ice's James Baylog and Racing Extinction's Luis Sahoyos have created visually compelling films that convey the urgency of these environmental catastrophes. They are racing against time, chasing breathtaking imagery that will hopefully compel audiences to do something to stop climate change. With regards to racing extinction, Sahoyos and his nonprofit organization, the Oceanic Preservation Society, are on a mission to initiate a movement. They are offering a revamped, technologically savvy take on the environmental movement begun in the 1970s. This present day environmental movement is focused on visually documenting the loss of biodiversity in real time. If you saw the 2005 Academy Award winner for Best Documentary, The Cove, then you are familiar with the director, Luis Sahoyos, and the Oceanic Preservation Society. You are also familiar with their unconventional style of documentary filmmaking that includes action thriller intrigue and high-tech gadgets, all employed for the sake of capturing footage for environmental advocacy purposes. Therefore, when Sahoyos and his crew set out to make a new film, they featured this caper aesthetic, including undercover exposés. They originally called this film The Heist. Like The Cove, Racing Extinction also conveys the emotionally compelling, activism-driven filmmaking designed to inspire massive outreach efforts beyond the film. For The Cove, the extensive outreach included a text messaging campaign, a television series, a blog, short videos, and a PSA starring the late, great Robin Williams. The advocacy for dolphins was passionate and inspiring. We have yet to see what incredible changes emerge from Racing Extinction. But while The Cove was, sweeping, was a sweeping action thriller, Racing Extinction features more meditative yet enthralling vignettes. In what to me is one of the most heartbreaking scenes of the film, bioacoustics researcher Chris Clark states, the whole world is singing, clicking, grinding, whistling, and thumping, but we've stopped listening. I would like to urge the audience to not only think about what you see in this film tonight, 
but to consider how we might begin listening to nature. This film is part of a creative collaborations effort supported by the following departments. Integrated Program in the Environment, Department of History and Philosophy of Science, the Media School, the Documentary Center for Research and Practice. Along with these sponsors and various other departments, instructors, and groups across campus have expressed interest in this film, recognizing the significance of this topic. Therefore, I urge all of you to stick around after this film for a short Q&A session that will be led by Field Office Supervisor Scott Pruitt and Endangered Species Specialist Lori Pruitt from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. They join us to help initiate a conversation about endangered species in Indiana and the Midwest. My hope is, is that tonight's screening and subsequent discussion will produce more environmental advocacy in the Bloomington community. Once again, I would like to thank the departments that have helped bring Racing Extinction to the cinema, specifically Amit Hagar, Sarah Mincy, Gregory Waller, and Joshua Malitsky. I'd also like to extend my immense gratitude to Brittany Friesner and the IU Cinema for enabling this opportunity. And I would like to thank Scott and Lori Pruitt in advance for taking the time tonight to join us for the Q&A session after the screening. With that, please enjoy the film. Well, thank you for sticking around. This is the Q&A portion. Um, I recognize it's going to be kind of tricky since uh, Scott here is not a filmmaker, so if you have specific questions about the filmmaking, I'm sorry we can't help you with that. But uh, he does work for U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and you saw they um, definitely had a part um, in this movie. So um, I asked him to come and kind of give us the local um, touch to this, kind of talk about what we can do, what is being done um, to address endangered species and wildlife issues here in the Midwest. So with that, Scott, please help us out. Thanks, Katie. I should have previewed the film because <laughs> uh, I'm not sure I would have agreed to this. <laughs> it's very emotional for me. Dedicated my life to just this kind of thing and to watch that. So. I think we all cried during this movie. I, uh, I should have, yeah, I should have said something earlier about it. it's a very emotional film. Let me plow through this boring presentation compared to what you just saw, and maybe I'll be able to get my grip back. I'm here representing the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I assume you can all hear me. If you can't, wave. Um, I tend to project, particularly when I get a little emotional, so I probably get loud and maybe a little bit too loud. But um, Fish and Wildlife Service, of course, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, United States Fish and Wildlife Service, um, has offices, as you know, refuges, and, and several different offices across the country. Um, our particular office here in Bloomington uh, deals primarily with endangered species issues. Uh, and there's offices like ours in every state and many of our territories like Samoa and uh, Costa Rica and the like. And uh, so we are trying to do that one thing. I like that at the end, do that one thing. And I like to think that myself, our staff, and our office are doing that one thing, including the Fish and Wildlife Service. And we have that one federal law, the Endangered Species Act, that really does make a difference, at least uh, in the United States and somewhat uh, uh, internationally. Uh, in the United States, we have uh, 1,594 threatened and endangered species. That's a lot. Um, foreign, uh, we've also listed under the Endangered Species Act 587 species. The Endangered Species Act requires us or challenges the Fish and Wildlife Service to do two things, and that is to, to uh, regulate or try to control take of these endangered species, which are take means harm, harass, kill, change their uh, breeding habits, basically bad things for them, uh, against them. And then the other thing that we do is, is try to recover them, to find ways to conserve the, their numbers and to recover the numbers so they no longer need protection under the Endangered Species Act. The foreign uh, species that are listed under the, the Federal Endangered Species Act, the 587, of course, we can't, U.S. government can't tell other agencies or other governments how to regulate their 
um, um, their species. But what we can do is, is affect um, trade and import and export. So we have a very strong uh, law enforcement uh, activity on import and export of foreign uh, endangered species and their parts, unfortunately. Parts are a big, big part of it, as you saw. Um, and currently we have a, a, a program called Operation Crush. And that's uh, a concerted effort to try to control uh, elephant tusks and um, rhino uh, uh, horns and other parts. And it's been pretty successful. Uh, a lot of people are in jail. Uh, we've uh, been able to collect over $7 million in fines and other restitutions. And a lot of uh, big smuggling rings are, are broken up or in jail. We haven't won the battle, but I think we're making great progress. And, and the service, I say service, that's the Fish and Wildlife Service, takes great pride in that. Another way that we help with uh, foreign species is uh, we have a, uh, international affairs um, office, and they have a program called Wildlife Without Borders, where we grant uh, uh, other countries to help their law enforcement um, help them with conservation by buying land, doing restoration of endangered species habitat. And that's a very proactive step and has been very successful also. So those are the kinds of things we're doing on a, on a, a global scale and with other, uh, other countries. And, and uh, just to give you, again, a scale of in, even in, in the United States, we have approximately 1,600 listed species. Dialing it down a little bit to Indiana, uh, here we have 27 listed species, 25 are endangered or threatened, one's proposed, and one is a non-essential experimental population. And you could ask me what that means later. Um, of those species, 10 are freshwater mussels that we find in, in the rivers uh, and streams in, in Indiana. They have a lot of really cool names like fat pocketbook and uh, white cat's pearly mussel. So, I mean, to most people, if you find them in a stream, they look like a rock, but they're, they're, they're very cool, and, uh, and uh, Indiana should take some pretty good pride, and we have some of the best mussel streams in the Midwest, if not the, the U.S. Um, four birds are listed, including the whooping crane, three bats, including our namesake, the Indiana bat, uh, two reptiles, two insects, both are butterflies, and six plants, including, again, some pretty cool names like running buffalo clover. Um, going back to that 1,600 acres of, of listed species in Indiana or in the U.S., you'd think, well, geez, you guys aren't doing a very good job. You know, the list is, it's, it's, it's large and it keeps growing, and it does grow every year. I think we take some pride, at least a little, that in fact that it's a large number and it's staying large because species go on endangered species list because of long degradation of their habitat, of hunting, of over harvesting like you saw here. And that goes on for decades. And we don't list things until they're very, very basically, you know, in the in the ER room and they need our help. So it takes years to turn that uh, habitat restoration around and, and to educate people to stop the the uh, har over harvest and those sorts of things. So the fact that we can keep these species on the endangered split species list is a success in and itself. So uh, we're, we're doing our best. And we do recover some at, at some times, but, uh, and we do, uh, I think, pretty well. Just as an example, uh, just this year, the American Bird Conservancy put out a, a report that showed that of all the bird species that have been listed and are listed on the endangered species list, 70% of them are either recovered, uh, on the road to recovery, or have stable populations. So that's 70%. We'd like it to be 99, we'd like it to be to 100, but the fact that uh, uh, we've got 70% on the right path is, is pretty good. And I was right, I'm not as emotional now. I feel a little bit like I can speak, so. Um, that's all I just wanted to kind of dial it down to what we've got going here in, in Indiana and just open up uh, to questions. Okay, before we open up, I just want to ask, uh, what brought you into the Fish and Wildlife Service? 
Well, as a kid, I mean, I, I grew up, you know, lived out in the country, loved, you know, going to the creek, going to the river, going through the woods, and just had a love for that, and decided I want to be a biologist at an early age, and kind of worked my way through, went to college, ended up in Indiana. I don't know, I didn't even know where Indiana was when I was a kid. I grew up in Idaho, and, and you go where there are jobs. Uh, I'm lucky to have a job as a professional wildlife biologist. They're, they're hard to come by. There's not a lot of us. Unfortunately, I wish there was a lot more. So you go where you can find a job and, and, and do that one thing. All right. Uh, are there questions? So because this is being filmed, I'm going to repeat your questions. Um, so she asked about the whooping crane um, and the way Hoosiers are not helping them. <laughs> well, a lot of Hoosiers are helping them. Like, we, we should all agree to that. But there are people with guns that shoot whatever flies by. And unfortunately, we've lost a few. And they have been investigated and prosecuted. Um, they're prosecuted and within local... Uh, uh, jurisdictions and some believe maybe not their greatest about penalties have been paid but they have been prosecuted to the length of the law that we can uh, we've got a lot of outreach going on we've got a lot of uh, things trying to help uh, whooping cranes and Hoosier State should be very proud that uh, we have this uh, um, non-essential experimental uh, population that's a new population that we're, the Fish and Wildlife Service with partners are trying to establish in the Midwest. And I don't know if you've seen, there's been movies about, they take ultralights and have the cranes follow them. And they're, they're nesting in, or they've taken the young in Wisconsin and then taken them to Florida and, then, and flying them back and forth. Well, I think a majority of the birds, and help me wrong, Lori, most of those birds right now spent much of, if not all, of the winter in, in Indiana than any other place. About half of that population. So they were supposed to go Wisconsin to Florida, Wisconsin to Florida. Well, they're getting to Indiana saying, hey, this is pretty nice. I think I'll just stay here. And they're, and they're doing okay. We don't have a lot of breeding going on. We don't have any breeding going on in Indiana yet, but we're hoped to. But uh, I think, again, uh, the Hoosier State should be proud of some of our West wetland restoration efforts and... Uh, uh, it's a place that they, they seem to like. So the question was about endangered species, specifically in the Monroe County. Well, let's see. Uh, I would say none of the mussels. Uh, whooping cranes maybe fly by now and then. So maybe none of the birds. Ah, bats. Indiana bats. Uh, boy, I don't know that we get any gray bats. Threatened uh, northern long-eared bats are found in, in, uh, in Monroe County. Uh, reptiles are eastern Massasauga and copper belly water snake, neither of which are here. Neither are either the butterflies, Mitchell Sater or uh, Corner Blue. Help me, Laura. I don't know that we have any of the plants here. So the two bat species, most of a lot of our uh, endangered uh, uh, species are in the northern, either more northern extreme or the southern extreme. We're kind of in the middle, but but you know with our nice because of our forest, that's why both of those bat species are endangered, and, and the large expanse that southern India had, has is the reason that we have those two.
So the question was about, um, <laughs> great, thanks, Saul. I could have counted on you to do this. <laughs> um, uh, the way land development um, is Let being me answer addressed. I can paraphrase it and okay. I can answer cool. it at the same time. <laughs> cool. uh, the, the question is, what, how does the endangered species and protecting endangered species come into uh, habitat impact development? Uh, use an example, I-69 and apartment complexes. Um, endangered Species Act, uh, our first role is to ensure that the continued existence of the species uh, happens. So you can imagine if you have, like Indiana bat, 22 states, 26 states. It occurs in 26 states. So any one individual project, it would have to be really big and to affect the continued existence of that species. Um, so there's that step, but it, there is still a, uh, it is a violation of the act to take an endangered species to you know wantonly kill it or destroy it. Uh, so you need a permit. Well, in order to get a permit, the first step you have to do is to try to minimize by working with us to the maximum extent practical that you can and still have a viable project, and then mitigate for those impacts. I-69 is an example. Over 3,000 acres of forested habitat has been restored and protected uh, throughout the, the, the length of the project. So there is some good. Yes, it's an ugly scar on the landscape, and I'm not, I won't say that I'm a proponent of that ugly scar, but you know, development does go forward. So we have that ultimate trigger of, of jeopardy and the continued existence. But beyond that, we try to minimize and then try to mitigate for that impact. Can you uh, emphasize your the role of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife again? Like, do people come to you with these problems, or well, you... right? Any federal any federal monies that spent in the state of Indiana prior to that expenditure, the the uh, federal agency that's uh, doing that project needs to consult with or basically come to the Fish and Wildlife Service to say, we've got this project, we're going to spend this money tell us whether or not it has an impact on uh, endangered species. And that's called the Section 7 consultation process that we fulfill on all projects. So oh, that question was about invasive species, particularly in Indiana, and how they may or may not be harming native species. Well, they are, they are of course. Um, anytime, you know, multiflora rose or amur honeysuckle, those are plants that take over the understory and basically choke out any of the native plants. And unfortunately, both of those plants and many others are, are not good wildlife plants because the species that we have here, the native species, evolved using native plants. So they're, um, it'd be difficult for me to pinpoint and measure exactly where, but uh, it does cause problems, particularly like uh, one of the butterflies we have up north, uh, Mitchell Sater, is uh, very tuned into what's called a calcareous fen, and it has native plants in it, and if, if uh, invasive species invade those fens, which they can easily, they'll choke out all of the, uh, the native plants in there, and that's the forage source for the, uh, the larvae of the, of the uh, of the, of the butterflies and, and they simply wink out and we're down to one known uh, population in the state of Indiana and it's I think a big part of drainage is one but also invasive species that have taken over those fins so it's a big deal and we could spend hours but it, it, it is a concern and we we're working towards trying to solve that too all right uh, we have room for one more or are we done Oh, oh, you have a question, question. Okay, go ahead. We, we do, and, and fortunately, universities are the most enlightened. And uh, an, another big species that we're working on right now is, is monarch and you know pollinator species. And so we're working with the Department of Transportation. We're working with universities, with uh, 
Duke Energy, uh, all these uh, uh, big uh, companies that do a lot of landscape impact to, instead of planting fescue, instead of planting something that grows quickly and might look nice and is easy to maintain, is actually you know of no use to many of our native species. So we're sharing with them uh, native, native uh, species mixes, uh, encouraging them to plant um, native trees and shrubs. And I'd like to think the university, uh, uh, I think IU is, I know I haven't spoken with them directly, but I, I can't believe that they haven't turned that corner also. We, we fight that particularly with DOT. I don't know if those of you that drive between here and, and Ellettsville, uh, people say, well, why aren't they mowing that? It looks terrible. It's growing up. It looks great. That's the way it should look. Uh, uh, there's a lot of pollinate, you know, good pollinator uh, habitat there, and it's mostly native species. DOT did a good job in planning that. It, it's a, it's a, a good place to drive by and look at more of what native roadside should look like. Saves a lot of money, too. Where were you all earlier? <laughs> the question is, if you're a, a residential homeowner, what can you do to, to, to make your landscaping more native. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, or fws.gov forward slash Midwest. Uh, do some surfing in there. There's a lot of information. If you have questions, find our office. Call it. We have uh, uh, called Partners for Fish and Wildlife. That, that's their job. They work with local uh, and private landowners to restore and enhance wildlife habitat on their property. So we have whole programs for that and get in there and, and search around. If you have problems and can't find it, give us a call. All right, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Um, Scott has to go feed his dog. So <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for asking such great questions. Um, please join me in thanking Scott and Lori.